Okay, we're counting down here. There we go. All right. Good evening. I'm Steve Clegg. I'm the interim pastor at the Second Baptist Church. And we're doing our midweek Bible study um, broadcast. Um, so like I say, glad you're with us um, this evening. Like I say, we're going to continue in Jim, uh, Judges chapter 16. We're going to wrap up the account of Samson. And hopefully we'll learn from from him. And uh, I guess you want to call it a retrospective way. <laughs> not do as he said, but do as God says. And Samson was not the best model for a lot of people. Um, and we've seen that as we've gone through this study, and we'll kind of hit on that a little bit more as we finish up this evening. Um, but like I say, with that, we're going to be into our Bible study here in just a moment. Um, just want to cover a few announcements. Um, like I say, um, Sunday mornings, we're doing our drive-in service, um, 9 a.m. Um, if there's inclement weather or something happens, um, we'll let it known out on Facebook or through the, um, the church phone tree. Um, the prayer chain will use those means, um, pass the word along. Uh, like I say, come in, find you a parking spot, tune your radio to 87.9. Um, with that, you can listen to this through your car and turn your heat on or air conditioning, depending on what the weather's been. <laughs> the last few weeks, we kind of had it both ways, I think. Um, it was a little bit nippy Sunday, but like I say, a few weeks ago, it was a little bit warm. So you can <laughs> flip it back whichever way it makes you comfortable, or if you're sitting up close, you possibly can hear it through the speaker and just roll your window down and listen, whatever works best for you. Um, but like I say, invite people out. There's a lot of churches um, restricted with what they're doing. Um, some don't have the resources to do outside services, just very various things going on. Uh, if you saw on the news today, more restrictions are coming back. Um, didn't list out churches specifically, but again, we're seeing restrictions coming back as viruses continue to continue bleh, to grow. Um, Sunday was the last um, day to turn into Christmas cards, so we'll be getting those out to everybody. Um, Christmas offering, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The goal this year is 2000 um, So be making your plans to contribute to that. We'll probably be taking the gifts through the end of the month as we usually do. Um, so we'll be doing that. Um, anytime if you're at a service and you get out of the car, please make sure you put on a mask. And I've been seeing a lot of people doing that. So I really appreciate that. Um, also, the Methodist Church food pantries, there is needs within the community. Um, like I say, several different groups are, are trying to meet those needs. And now today with the restrictions, uh, they're going to be put back onto restaurants and social places and all. The needs are probably going to increase as some businesses are going to be hit again, which are going to affect people's employment. Um, so like I say, we just need to be in prayer over that. So like I say, um, that's what's going on there as far as announcements. Um, we did have some birthdays this week. Mac McMorrow had his birthday. On the 6th, and Cynthia McMara had hers um, today on the 8th. So, like I said, we wish them happy birthday. Um, looking at prayer requests, um, in the bulletins, Joe and Marion Edwards, Sal Shirelli, Ronnie Locklear, John and Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, Mike and Teresa Ivey, Robert Muser, Shirlene Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Elizabeth Norton, Peggy DeLuca, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Rob Dash, Jimmy Terry, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom and Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, JJ Johnson, um, Karen Clegg, my wife, and she went to the doctor today and she is healing up um, very nicely from the surgery. The doctor's just telling her to take it very easy, um, not to be pulling on that area, doing any kind of heavy lifting, but he was pleased with that and he'll do another follow-up with her in several weeks. Um, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis, um, continue to keep Michael in your prayers uh, with his shoulder. Bob Harrell, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow, Peggy Kane, Joe Haight, Landon Freeman, Billy Grooms, um, Ben Gorganis, Bobby Pate. Um, also, like I say, um, Bobby, remember him and Lorraine. Lorraine, like I say, is having some trouble healing um, from her surgery. Um, so we pray for um, Lorraine specifically for her healing. Um, Shaquilla Clayton, HC, HC's having some problems, he's having some falls, remember him. Diane Townsend, Eugene Ivey, Lisa Moreau, Eugene Ivey, Eugene and Florine Eford, Shannon Britt, Danny Westbrook, um, continue to remember him, good days and bad days. Um, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost, our nation, its leaders, our troops and their families, and then the police officers and then the pastors and their families. 
Also, um, we added to this Irene Hernan. Um, continue to remember her. Miss Patsy, um, remember Patsy Butler? She had a fall. Um, like I say, she's healing. Um, my Rachel, um, still waiting to get her into a cardiologist. Her heart rate um, continues to be very high. Um, Jennifer will be having surgery coming up, so remember her. And then I also put on per list a lady that works with me, her granddaughter, Chloe Akers. And like I said, that baby is having a hard time um, talking with her grandmother today. Still not getting seizures fully under control. Um, baby is just born Thanksgiving week and just struggling. Um, has a genetic, I, I guess, mutations, what they're calling it. It's birth defect, the way I look at it. But um, she suffers from lysencephaly, which is where a portion of the brain did not fully develop. Um, so, like I say, be in prayer for that family and that baby. Um, they're hoping to get her stabilized and send her home soon, at least to give the family a break before they take her back and continue with more therapy and different treatments. So, like I say, be in prayer for that family as well. Um, if you've not noticed or not heard today, the, um, the added more restrictions um, back. Um, curfews being put in place, stay at home. Um, just a lot of different things going on. If this virus it continues to escalate, um, it's spreading very quickly. And most of it's coming from just people being irresponsible. We were within eyesight of the goal line. <laughs> we, the vaccines are starting to come out. Um, hopefully they're going to get approved and possibly start vaccinating next week. Although it's going to be a while. You start trying to figure out how you're going to populate you know, at least 70, 75% of the United States, as well as the rest of the world at the same time with these vaccines. It's going to be a major undertaking. But like I say, uh, we need to be in prayer with that. We need to be responsible. I would hate to think that, you know, so we get this close to the end, somebody getting vaccine that can save their life and somebody be irresponsible and not take the proper precautions and that person gets sick or even die just shy of reaching the goal of getting to these vaccines, like I say. So we need to just really be in prayer over this situation. Pray that the vaccines, you know, bring them out. Because like I say, God has worked a lot of things in this. Uh, a lot of people are sitting there saying, hey, look what we did as man, but it's not what man did, it's what God's allowed us to do. And that's part of, you know, some of what we have to understand as Christians. And like I say, well, that's in other discussions that we'll have at some point. Like I say, we need to be in prayer for this nation in this world. Just so many people suffering. Um, and like I say, the sad thing of it is there's so many suffering from the virus, but there's other people who are not seeking out treatment that need it for other things or can't get to treatment because of the virus for other things. So it's a sort of a, a two-edged sword that we're just not seeing it as much. So be in prayer over all that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. And Father, we praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just thank you for the many blessings. And Father, you give us each and every day. And Father, may we live for you. May we serve you in all that we do, Father. And may we live each day to the fullest, not for our glory, but for your glory. The things that you allow us to do each and every day, you strengthen and enable us, Father. And Father, we lift up our prayer list, Father. There's just so many names on it. And Father, this is just a surface. Because each and every individual within the congregation, I'm sure, has an additional things that they pray for each and every day. Additional people and situations and decisions and concerns. And Father, I know that this list just multiplies. But Father, you hear all of it. And you're faithful to answer. That's the wonderful thing of it. You're faithful to answer. As according to your will and your wisdom and your understanding. Father, help us to draw close to you. Help us to be near you. And Father, we just pray for all those who are afflicted by this virus. Father, we just pray that they'll be healed. And Father, that they grow stronger. Father, we don't want to see another person die. And Father, we just pray for the safety of people. And pray that people will be responsible and do the precautions they need to keep each other safe. There's just so much that we can do to It's common sense to make others safe, Lord. We just need to take those steps, especially we as Christians need to show our compassion for others by doing these things. And Father, we pray for those on our prayer list. Several, some have been hurt in the last couple of weeks. And Father, we just pray for their healing. Uh, Father, that they'll recover from their injuries. Others have had surgery recently and are in healing. Lord, we just pray for that healing. And Father, we just pray for quick healings. And that the body will heal 
and close over to some are struggling to, to experience that healing, Lord. We just pray for their healing of their bodies, Lord. And Father, we pray for those who are in rehab and who are getting stronger. Father, just pray continue to bless them and strengthen their bodies, Lord. And Father, we have others who have surgeries and procedures coming up. And Father, we just pray for them. We know that you're already there. You're already preparing the way and you're going to bring them through it. And Father, we just thank you for that. And Father, we pray for those who are grieving as we've had losses within the community recently, even within the church family, as people have had losses within their families. Father, we pray for those families and bless them, Lord, and comfort them in their time of need. And Lord, it's hard, but we know you are the comforter and that you will send the comforter to us. And Father, we pray for our nation. We still have division. We still don't have peace after the elections. We're still bickering and fighting in so many places and pointing fingers. And now we're, you know, coming through, getting ready to, you know, in another month or so to inaugurate a president. And there's just turmoil and bickering and fighting. And we need peace, Lord. We need the people to work together. And Father, this pandemic, it struck the nation. The numbers growing quickly. Father, so many people have grown tired of the restrictions, grown tired of doing the precautions, and they're throwing it to the wind. And Father, it's being dangerous. And Father, some people are dying because of people who are not caring. We can't just be a part-time Christian. We can't just be a part-time carer. We have to care all the time. And Father, help us to do those things and to take care of them. And Father, we pray for the vaccines. Father, we pray that you, under your guidance and your protection and your strength, Lord, that they will prevent the virus from spreading and that they will bring about healing. And Father, just use these as your tools. I know that you helped develop them, Lord. You gave the people the minds to be able to develop them, the insight to understand these things. Father, bless them. And Father, we pray for the many people who are in shut-in situations. We have many that are shut in that aren't getting out. Lord, don't let them feel alone. Let them know that you're there. Comfort them, Lord. And Father, may we send them cards and do things to help them. And Father, we pray for their protection. Many are, some are in care facilities, Lord. And Father, we pray for those as they're dependent upon other people to protect them and to provide for them and take care of them, Lord. Watch over them and watch over their caretakers. And Father, we pray for our first responders, our medical people, or those who are dealing on the front lines of this virus. Father, keep them safe. Many of us know people who deal with the virus every day in their job. Watch over and keep them, Lord. Protect them and pray that you'll watch them. And Father, we pray also for our police officers and those who are dealing with the issues on the streets. Who, you know, in their course in a normal day are coming in contact with it possibly. As they're trying to do a job that's not related to the virus, but related to other things. And Father, we pray for our military. Protect and keep them, Lord. Many are in dangerous situations around the world. Watch over them, Lord. Bring them home safely. And Father, this time of year that they're separated from their families, Father, we just pray that you'll give them peace and let them feel the love of their families and your love, Lord. That will give them a peace so that when they do come home, they can celebrate the holidays with their family. It may be <laughs> maybe another month or maybe another year that they can celebrate them together in joy and separate ways. And Father, we pray for the church. Father, if ever the church needed to stand up and lead the way and to show how to care for one another, how to have compassion, how to be responsible, it's now, Lord. Use the church to be a witness. Use the church to be an example to show people how they should respond in times of crisis and pandemic. Father, we just lift up the church. Guide us and direct us, Lord. May we follow your will, not our will. Let us not do things according to our will, but according to your will, Father. That we bring glory to your name. And Father, as we study your word this evening, strengthen us. Open our hearts, open our ears, Lord, that we'll receive the message from your word. That we'll grow closer to you, Lord. And learn how to do the things according to your will, Lord. Bless us and guide us now in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up in chapter 16 of Judges. And like I say, with this, we're studying Samson and 
like I say, Samson, as popular as he was for his great strength and amazing feats that he did, we do not see the judge that we saw in the earlier chapters of Judges. We don't see the one who's leading the people. We don't see the judge who's pulling them together. And uh, we don't see him leading them back to God. We just see Samson pursuing his own ends. He's a one-man show. And he serves himself. And this, you know, time and time again, we see Samson making statements. And they're shown that he's serving himself, pursuing his own interests. Now, the good side of this and the thing that we sometimes over, we don't overlook, but we say, well, this is God's word. Will, yes, it is God's will that Samson do these things, but not in rebellion to God. God never wants his children to rebel against him. He would much rather Samson be saying to God's glory, God using him in the feats that he needs to be done, but doing it according to God's will. But again, God has blessed Samson. He set him apart as a Nazarite, and he's going to use him. Even in Samson's rebellion against God, and he demonstrated this rebellion against authority with his very parents when he was disrespectful with them. And he told them, hey, go get me that woman. And they're like, you know, you need to take an Israelite bride. And he said, no, I want her. Go get me that Philistine woman, an enemy, someone who is not of their race, which is against God's word. And Samson, you know, rebelled against his parents, which is, was just no problem for him to take the next step and rebel against God and the actions that he did. And all but God uses him. In spite of Samson, God uses him to stir up the Philistines, which was the purpose of Samson's life, to stir them up. And so, like I say, God uses Samson to set the stage that the Philistines later will be defeated. So here, like I say, Samson didn't defeat him, but Samson did a lot of work against him. So like I say, God never told Samson to go and slay the thousand soldiers or go set the Philistine crops on fire. Samson was doing this out of his anger and seeking vengeance. We see these things back there. Remember, he was saying, well, look what they did to me. This is what I want to do to them. God didn't tell him to go do them. He did it on his own. He was seeking out vengeance. He didn't like the situation where his first wife was given to a, another man. And then later they, they had, a, had her and her father killed you know, he sought out revenge. I gave him this great strength and the ability to do these amazing things. And Samson used them to serve himself. How many Christians today have gifts and talents, but they use them to serve themselves rather than to serve God? We see this in a lot of different ways. And this can come all the way from people who are good with numbers and administration and organization, you know, singing, talents, all whatever you want to call it. They use them to serve their self and their self-interest, but they won't bring them to church and use them for God. They step back and say, no, I can't do that. I don't have time. I don't, you know, I'm not. God blessed them with something and they won't use it for God. We need to look at that as Christians. And remember Israel here during the time of Samson, as he was a judge, they weren't calling out for God to relieve them of their oppressors, the Philistines. They weren't looking for that. Matter of fact, if anything, they got mad with Samson. They Samson, tone it down. Quit picking on them. Quit going and stirring them up. You're causing us problems, Samson. You know, they were wanting, they were okay with, hey, it is what it is. We can live with this. And Samson, you just need to quit. They're ready just to lie down in it all and just live with the oppressors. God don't want us to be oppressed. God don't want us to be put under somebody's thumb. And all that's not really his will. But we choose that when we make the decisions that we do. We choose that when we do the things that are glorifying to ourselves and not glorifying to God. We put ourselves in bad situations many times by the decisions we make. So we have to, you know, watch that. But here, like I say, again, it's just amazing what God can do, you know, even with the worst and misguided actions of individuals to accomplish his will. You know, you think about it. You know, why were the Philistines oppressing Israel? Because Israel had fallen away from God. So God was using an ungodly people. Matter of fact, they worshiped another God. He was using them to oppress his people, to teach them and to punish them for their walking away from him. Just as I used the other ones, you know, that we've studied earlier in Judges and, you know, and the tribes that, that came back. God uses them. You know, you think of Nebuchadnezzar and 
and the Babylonians. God used them to punish Israel for their walking away, for not following his will. They were not Christian nations. They were not godly nations. They were pagan nations with idols and all this other stuff. But God used them to carry out his will. And it's sort of that way with Samson. Samson is not holding to his Nazarite vow. He, he is a Nazarite from birth. And rather than holding to that, he follows his own will. But God still uses him. Even his rebellion, God uses him. And he'll accomplish things for Samson. But the sad thing of it is because of the way Samson lives his life and the choices he makes, he brings about consequences that's going to lead to his eventual downfall. Matter of fact, we're already to the point he's already been captured and and blinded and Samson's you know eventually going to die as we'll read you know this evening in our scripture and we're going to see it it didn't have to happen that way probably oh if Samson had just made the right choices and done it God's way it may have been a totally different story but Samson you know he made the choices and he has to face the consequences just like we have to face the consequences of the choices we make but like I say last time when we left off, Samson was captured with the hands of Delilah. A woman captured him, basically. She pushed and pushed and pushed on him. Samson was, he lusted for her in his eyes. He wanted her to be her, to be with him. You know, he put her first. And because of that, he chose between her and his Nazarite vow. He told her the secret that his strength lay in his hair, which it didn't. But his hair was a symbol of his dedication to God. What it represented was he was chosen of God. Everybody that saw Samson said, there is a Nazarite because he has hair that has never been cut. You know, that's a symbol that he is a God's person. And he chose that. He would portray, portray that and say, Delilah, if you cut my hair, I'll lose my string. He probably never thought it would happen because he knew that the Nazarite vow of the hair was just a symbol. But when he did it in the way he did, God removed himself from him. He removed his spirit from him and the Samson's strength left him. And because of that, Samson was captured. And they put out his eyes. They took him down and they put him in the grinding house or the grinding house place where he pushed on this bar all day long, walking in a circle, just like a, a donkey or, or an ox or whatever they would use to move it. And well, he became a beast of burden. And he pushed it all day long, grinding the grain for the people that poured it into the grinding mill. It was not easy work. It was heavy work. And he did it all day long. Every day, that was his job, as he was a prisoner. But while he's at the grinding wheel, we're told in verse 22, Samson's hair begins to grow. So let's pick up this evening of verse 23 in our message. We're going to read 23 and 24. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god. And rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they say, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Samson is one of three men in, in Scripture basically identified as going into darkness. The other two is King Saul. Who went into the darkness of last minute when he went and consulted a witch or what would happen with the future judas went out immediately at night into the darkness and led them back to portray jesus and saul lived for the world or excuse me samson lived king saul lived for the world judas lived for the silver and Samson lived for the flesh. Judas gave himself to the devil. Saul to his own desires. He couldn't wait on God. 
and all three of them lost their lives in the end. Not only did Saul lose his life, but he lost his kingdom. His family would never have the kingdom. Judas took 30 pieces of silver and then went out and hanged himself. Samson, as we'll see this evening, will end up dying with his enemy. Lives that didn't have to go that way. But they chose and faced the consequences of their decision. But in each of these three cases, God used these three men to accomplish his purpose. The fall of King Saul set up the path for David to become king. Judas' betrayal of Christ for 30 pieces of silver set the stage for the crucifixion of Christ, which was the sacrifice for our sins, that we could have eternal life. And Samson, the slaying of the enemy, the stirring up of the enemy, as God had planned, setting the stage for their eventual fall of the Philistines. It's hard to believe and you think about it. Why did they choose these things? King Saul had it going for him. He was chosen. He, he had it going for him. He had heirs already born, son, to be his, you know, his heir. And God was with him as long as he fo you know, followed him. But then he got impatient with God and wanted a decision. And he, he goes out and consults a witch. Why did he turn? God. He couldn't wait on the Lord. He couldn't wait on God to send Samuel to tell him what to do. Judas, think about it. For the three years, he walked with Christ. He was there with the feeding of the 5,000. He helped serve the people. He was there with the healings. He was part of the ministry. And then they dangle a bag of coins in front of his eyes. And he snatches the coins. And betrays his friend. The one he's walked with for three years. He followed his eyes. Rather than his heart. But actually his heart was black. So I guess he did follow his heart. Because he betrayed a friend. But then he went out and hung himself after he realized what he had done. But here, Samson, his head was shaven, he's pushed the wheel, and his hair begins to grow back. Again, like I say, the strength is not in the hair, it's a symbol. But that's what with Nazarites would do if they broke the vow when they took the vow of being a Nazarite. And they broke the vow of doing something because they became unclean or someone. They would shave their head and start over again. Samson's head was shaven. He'd never done that before, even though he had became unclean by touching a dead animal. He became unclean by, you know, touching the dead that you know, he slew and killed. And you know, he was unclean. But yeah, he never shaved his head. And in his fall, when he allowed his head to be shaved, I don't want to say it was a new beginning, but it was in a sense. Because Samson on that grinding wheel, you can't help but think that he had started, he had time to think. He had time to really roll over. What have I done? I'm blind. I'm pushing this stick, walking in circles all day long. I am as low as I can fall. He can't help but think that he did not start crying out to God. And recognizing what he had done wrong, at least to a point. And so again, the Philistines, as we're looking at this, they're gathered together to sacrifice their god Dagon. And they're claiming that Dagon had delivered Samson into their hands, that he had defeated their enemy. But it wasn't that. Dagon didn't do a thing. Samson did it to himself. He self-destructed when he told Delilah that cutting his hair would remove it because it really just separated him from God. He did put her. He chose the world over God. 
His hair was a symbol of a vow that was broken. And we know that Samson broke it many times, but here he finally breaks it and separates himself by having that his hair was cut off. Let's go on with verse 25 through 31. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And they were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that be held while Samson was made sport. And Samson called out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle, middle pillars, which upon the, which the house stood, and on it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zor and Eshtol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Notice here the humiliation of Samson. Here's a great man of strength, an enemy, one who, remember, he killed a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. And they've got him pushing a grinding stone. And then they say, hey, bring him out. You know, for the front of this 3,000 plus crowd. And they're saying they made sport of him. That means they did things to him that were amusing to themselves. Or Samson was forced to do things to entertain them. You imagine this great man of strength. And they probably had things that came up and were humiliating to him. He couldn't see him coming up. Maybe striking him from behind. So he lashed out and you know, trying to catch people that weren't there because they were moving too quickly. He couldn't see them. Or maybe they had just, you know, weak little things come up and push him around and pull at him and whatnot that he couldn't see. And they made him look bad. And they laughed and they mocked him. He was humiliated. The very fact that he was led around by a little, by a lad, a young boy, this great warrior, which is what they would have portrayed him as, a warrior, a man of great strength. It doesn't say the guards are pushing him around. No, it says he was led around by a lad. Like he was an old man or someone who was decrepit who needed somebody to help him. They humiliated Samson. They mocked him. And so he asked the boy leading him, he said, put me between the pillars of the house. The two one, two main ones that hold it up. And obviously Samson, remember, he came down to Gaza all the time and in the Philistine territory and walked around and looked at what he wanted to look at and you know, took of what he wanted. And I'm sure he had seen this place. It's a house of worship or, you know, call Sam or whatever. And he told the boy where to put him. And he put the one pillar on his right and one pillar on the left. And Samson prays to God, let me be avenged. Samson is really still wanting to serve himself. He's still wanting that eye for an eye justice. Look what they did to me. He says, I want to be avenged. They put out my eyes. They took my eyesight. They made a 
mockery of me. He wants revenge. He doesn't say he wants to do this to the glory of God, to destroy the enemies of God's people. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying to me, I want to be avenged. Still using his gifts for himself. And so God gives him his strength. Samson knew where to go to get his strength. He knew it came from God. At least, yeah, like I say, Samson wasn't, he wasn't totally bad. He was a godly man in a sense, and he knew where his strength came from. But Samson went to God. And God, for that one moment, gave Samson his strength back. And Samson pushed upon the pillars. We've seen it in the movies and the different pictures of depiction of this. And he bowed up. You can imagine it. To get all strength, he just bowed up his body with all he had. And he pushed the pillars. And the roof came down and the house crumbled and killed the people. It says they killed more in that one moment of the Philistines and he killed in his whole life. He didn't destroy them totally. Obviously he weakened them. Obviously he, he created problems for him and the fact that he killed some men and some men were leaders. But it cost him his life. He accomplished God's will in, in harming and stirring up the Philistines. But because of the choices and the decisions that Samson made in their life, it cost him his life. A horrible end to a life that had so much potential. How many Christians and people that call themselves Christians will face this type of thing? Not that you'll be eyes blinded and put between two pillars. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that the decisions and the consequences of your decisions will bring you to a horrible end. That you won't be what you should be. There's too many people who wear Christian symbols, particularly Christians. And I myself, like I say, even I, I wear a Christian symbol, but you like I say, most of you have never seen it. It's my cross that I wear. My mother gave it to me after my father passed. It was a cross that I knew him to wear for years. It wasn't a fa his fancy gold one. It was his sort of a lit platinum or lead silver. I mean, it's, it's sort of a dull and blackish one. But it's one that he wore. And I remember seeing it for so many years. And of course, it holds sentimental meaning to me. Because it's my father's and since my mother's gave it, I don't... You know, I wear it every day. I take it off at night and I put it on every morning. But many people put on symbols. They wear their crosses. And they don't mean a thing to them. And they go out into the world and the world sees these crosses and symbols that they're wearing and then they see a behavior that has nothing to do with Christ. Nothing that's glorifying to God. The words that come out of their mouths and the actions that they do, do anything but honor God. They really dishonor God. They're disgust. And they fuel the fires of the world who say Christians are nothing different. They're just like me and you. They claim they worship a God, but they act just like me and you. They say they're peacemakers and they yell and scream and demand what they want. Just like me and you. They think that anger solves problems. That it's okay to hate if you don't want to be around that person. It's okay to serve yourself. First,
Oh, how we tear down God when we do these things. And you don't have to wear a symbol. All you got to do is say, I'm a Christian. And tell people you're a Christian. Oh, I go to church. I do this. And, and all. And then go out and act just like the world. If anything, this pandemic has shown the world the true colors of too many people who claim to be Christians. Thinking about this message in this lesson, I was sitting there thinking about, oh, how many Christians have I heard? How many? And I probably could just go down the list. I probably could say, oh, I'm against abortion and we shouldn't be killing innocent babies. And I watch them during this pandemic and they're saying, oh, we need to be around as many people as we want. We need to be able to hug and hold on to each other. We don't need to wear masks. We don't need to social distance. We don't need. And I'm like, you wouldn't kill a child, but you'll kill your loved ones. If you've got the virus, you'll spread it. And you ask them why that's uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? Ask Jesus how comfortable the cross was. Ask Jesus how comfortable it was to have the, the 40 lashes less worn across his back. That tore the skin and the tendons and the muscle almost down to the bone. They stopped at 39 because they felt that 40 would kill a man. They would take you with one lash of death if they could do it. And if the person given the lashes miscounted, he himself had to take the lashes. Do you think that crown felt real good on Jesus' forehead? What about when they slapped him and beat him across the face and spit upon him? To me, Christians aren't comfortable doing things that make them uncomfortable. We like our pews soft, our sanctuaries cool or warm. We like things a certain way that is pleasing to us. But how pleasing are we to God? When we're worried more about ourselves and our comfort than what God would have us to do. Paul teaches that we should be all things to all people. Paul would live in poverty if it would help save someone. Paul saw his life as nothing but a means to get to people, to reach them for Christ. How many of us only want to be comfortable Christians? Sometimes we got to take on some uncomfort. I know that's not a proper word, but it's just to point out that you can't be comfortable all the time. You're going to endure some pain as a Christian. And if you can endure it, and do it to the glory of God, oh, how far you've grown. But too many people have a little bit of discomfort, and they complain, and they whine, and they bellyache. They have no faith in God. They don't trust him. They don't give it to God. They just think that God just needs to come down and take it all away, and they can just feel all better. So I like, kiss, kiss my boo-boo, and I'll be better. They don't want to grow up. Growing up hurts sometimes. We have to endure the trials and the temptations that we mature and that we grow and learn to rely on God. Samson is the perfect example of the life not to live, pretty much. There's a few fleeting moments in his life, but most of it's in rebellion and self-serving. See, each day we have to get up and make a choice. Do I live today as unto the Lord or do I live it the way I want to live it? To see what I can get, enter the rat race and see how much I can get. Too many people choose the rat race. Because they're comfortable there. They can hide among the masses. They don't draw attention to themselves. 
but too many people just don't realize that the rats go down in the sewer. How many people today even recognize what it is to live a day for the Lord? Do you? See, it's a conscious effort and one that we've talked in our past studies and probably the book of Philippians might be your best guide on how to live a life, how to live a day for the Lord. We can't be perfect as Christians. If you think you can, you're wrong. We can strive for perfection. We can try to do our very best and we can get better and better. We'll never be perfect. And probably what separates us so many times is what we do when we make a mistake. How do we respond to when we make a mistake in our life? How we do that really defines us and sets us apart from others. So who are you living for? Yourself? Or God? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, we give you the glory. Father Samson showed us so many wrong examples. Showed us so many things that we shouldn't do. How following the lust of our eyes will lead us down the wrong path. Father, let us look up and follow your will. Let us choose to give you glory. Let us choose to live for you each and every day. To honor you in all that we do. To give you glory. To give you all of us. Father, help us to make the decisions. To recognize what it is we need to do in our lives. To serve you fully. And to bring you glory. Watch over us and keep us, Lord. And bring us back together the next time. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being with us and pray you have a good evening. Good night.